Right, this is my mother, Brenda, in when, I think it was either a 21st birthday photo or when she got engaged, and that was when she was 21 as well. And she was doing her very own Who Do You Think You Are with Nikki and with Alicia's father long before anybody thought of a TV series. Um, at the time of this photo, all she knew was, was that she was the daughter of Fred Broom and she was the granddaughter of John and Agnes Broom in the middle of that photo we've already seen. Her father Fred is front left with the tennis racket. So when she first became interested, that's all she knew. But she was to find out that her grandmother, Agnes, was a Trithui and that she was the... Sorry, her, I got that wrong. She was, the great, therefore, the great-granddaughter of Samuel Trithui, and that's his pumping station at Crumford. I've often wondered what prompted her passion for the family's past. It wasn't always there. Got this slight jolt when Daisy died and everybody did fantastic family trees for the solicitors. But at that time, she didn't even know that her father was fifth of, uh, sixth in the family of 11. She couldn't say where he came. And at that time, my generation was very busy producing the next generation. That's the first five of her grandchildren. Six more came in rapid succession. And I think she was so busy going from one family to another through the path of the next newborn that she didn't have much time for the past. And she did have some strange myths about the family history. She was certain we were descended from Richard Trevithick, which isn't true. But Samuel Trethewey did install an engine, pumping engine, designed by Richard Trevithick. And I think that was the link. She also actually was sure we were descended from William IV, but that's not true either. And I found the source of that mystery, and it, I can see where the muddle came. Um, so, Alicia, who's here tonight, has a very unusual, well, quite unusual relationship with me. She's a double second cousin. And we, there are actually three Broom siblings married three Mortimer siblings. So there are three double connections between the family. And I think this spurred very much my mother's interest in family history on both sides. And Alaric, Alicia's father, had a wonderful um, collection, obviously, of photographs. He'd also kept very closely in touch with the cousins and the Broom diaspora a bit, and my mother didn't seem to have that same collection at all. I think partly because, you'll, I'll come to that later, but her parents' house had to be sold very quickly after her father's death. And I think a lot of stuff was just not kept and a lot of connections went. But among other people, Alaric put my mother in touch with Nikki Cunningham, who had this wonderful informed enthusiasm for family history, which was a good foil to my mother's rather less rigorous approach. <laughs> and, but across the generations, based at right the other end of the country, they had this amazing correspondence, absolutely masses of letters. And it, I think it was through Nikki that my mother realised she was a Trithui, and that's where, you know, absolutely nothing to do with Trevithick. So she had this wonderful fascination for her forebears, unusually clear childhood memories and a real determination to actually write it down. So this became a chicken and egg, because she wanted things to write about. And we've often told the older generation, I'm sure, and I'm even telling one of my older siblings to write it down, because it's history, and it gets lost, and it's so sad. Um, anyway, after my death, after my father's death, sorry, not my death. <laughs> <laughs> She, she joined a tutored writing group, so this was another thing, she had to produce writing, because if the writing group didn't publish something most years, then the tutor lost the funding and the group would have been disbanded. And this was in about the sort of 1980s, and that's the photograph of her then. Um, my father died in August, early August 1987, and by only by late September of that year, she and I were here at this mill in Matlock doing a tour and that's the letter inviting us to come and, from, and we Marston Smedley. from Marston oh. Smedley and he arranged a tour just for the two of us we didn't have to be a big group um, we did an absolute whistle stop um, two days both the family homes that's her first home, the Shaws in Matlock and she also lived at 
hillside, which I think is now a bit of a university or something. And we went to um, Cromford and the pumping station, and there's canal boats, and... Oh, that's a later one, sorry. Go back to canal boats. There we are. Um, she'd set everything up in a fantastic flurry of correspondence, two days. I was exhausted, and she was absolutely fine. <laughs> <laughs> So, for this writing group, one of the things she wrote was... That's actually Dethick Church, where we think um, John Broom was baptised. And that's Lee Hall, which we saw. And these are two family photos um, of the Fred Broom and his siblings when they were living at Lee, sorry, Lee Home. And the top row, we think, is... Um, Auntie, oh, it's Harriet, Auntie Tat, my Auntie Tatty, and Agnes. And the bottom row is Mary, then Fred, then May. And that one is the top, is Fred, obviously, and the two ladies are May and Agnes. So this is a picture from my, actually, this is my mother's youngest sister, and this is her in her christening robe. And it was included in her writing, which she called Child's Eye View, which was about her early childhood in Matlock. And it has lots of very, very minute domestic detail because she had this wonderful childhood memory and all sorts of incidents with friends and, and obviously a lot with her father. Um, another thing she loved to write about was <clears throat> when she had sort of coincidences happened in her life. She loved that sort of thing. And she wrote a charming piece called Crumbs Cast Upon the Waters. She'd written a piece for the Derbyshire Family History Society, which is about Samuel Trefui, and it's called A Cornishman in Derbyshire. And because of this, she got, a, she got contact from somebody called Daphne Slee, who's written a book about the Trefuis in Canada. I don't know if anybody else has seen it. I've got I've, a copy I've with copy, me. Yes, yes. yes. Um, Samuel Trefui had lost his second wife and then actually lost a leg. But he was a Trefui, so he moved on. He emigrated to Canada to join younger family members. And because of this contact with Daphne Slee, Slee, my mother was able to fill in that branch of the family and learnt all the successes that family had there. And she wrote at the time, my small crumbs had returned to me with interest indeed. But actually a year or two later, she had compound interest because she was invited by Ali and, Alan and Vivian Trithui to go and stay with them in, or near Vancouver. So she took the first long-haul flight of her life in the last year of her life, in fact. And they, absolutely wonderful, they just took her everywhere and showed her everything. And that's two photos from that time. And this is the, the Trithui family house near Vancouver, which uh, in Abbotsford, and that's been donated as a museum to the local authority or whatever by Alan. I haven't said much more about the Trithuis because I find they're incredibly well documented. Um, and the, the family tree that Nikki produced years and years ago is just absolutely vast. And in fact, my son found that one of his best friends at school was, he was called Varco, but he was actually a Trithui, mm -hmm. a, a distant cousin. Really? Yes. <laughs> Goodness. But the brooms, one of the researchers my mother engaged called them those troublesome brooms. And <laughs> as, <laughs> as Jane and everyone has found, they have been, you know, very difficult to trace. But, and you have talked about him in Leicester and the fact that he did work here before he went to Leicester and before he came back here. Um, but one thing my mother did... You know, she just put so much effort into it. She wrote to local historians, archivists, genealogists, and she, and she wrote to them in this country and in the New World. And I've got copies of death certificates from Ontario, wills from Liverpool, correspondence from the States, family tree from Haverford West, which Nikki thinks is different brooms, unfortunately, and a company report from a Trithui cobalt mine in Canada. But I do find it fascinating that we're looking for brooms because I imagine that 
if his mother had been able to give him any other name at the time of his baptism, she'd have been delighted and we'd actually have been looking for another family. But he was a broom, and so we're brooms. Um, so I'm now going to go to my grandfather, the full name Frederick, Frederick Samuel James Broom, always known as Fred. Um, obviously didn't have a great time at Smedley's. I'm, I'm fully, I don't think it was Mr Gregory's fault with the dinner ladies. I think it was probably Fred's. But he was the inventor of probably three household name brands. His life's a lot easier to document, although it does have some mysteries as well. Um, and my mother's memories were very clear, and she got information from her two sisters and also from Alaric's father and Alaric's uncle, who were very close um, friends. The families were very, very close. Um, and for all his faults, he was a larger-than-life character, and I think we're, I really have to talk a bit about his personal life to put his work problems in perspective. Um, one thing Jane doesn't know about Fred Broom is his first contact with Smedley's, apart from that through his father, when as a young boy, without a word to his family, and terrific worry to his poor mother, he disappeared for a whole day, and he'd actually hitched a ride on the annual Smedley outing to Blackpool. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, is just absolutely Fred, you know. Um, the chemistry in the university we've talked about. But one thing he, you may have noticed, he was born in 66. He didn't start working here till the 90-something, I think it was. Um, he had actually had a sort of series of gap years, which seemed to have lasted about a decade. And he definitely benefited from the broom trafui diaspora. He mined for gold in, gold in Tierra del Fuego. He worked as a stoker and a gaucho in Argentina. He herded ostriches from there across the Andes to Valparaiso. And he also hunted polar bears in Canada. And Kate, his daughter, remembered him saying that working inside the building when the view went no further than one field did make him long for the open spaces of the pampas. Apparently, John Broom had regretted that he'd spent his whole childhood in this relatively small part of England, here in Leicester, his whole life, and he wanted his children to see more of the world, and he gave each of his sons passage to one of the Americas and seed money. He sent the daughters all to finishing school in Europe. Uh, actually, Fred had his seed money stolen as soon as he got to Buenos Aires. <laughs> I've just reread Daphne Slee's um, chapter on Samuel Trefui in her book, which is called Go Ahead or Go Home. And you read that and you hear Jane talking about Fred, and actually you can't tell which person is which. I'll just quote a bit. Um, it appears here, doesn't it? Samuel's independence of mind did not always endear him to his employers. So this could be Fred and, the, and his own design of carding machine while he was still supposed to be working here. This is one of um, Samuel's pumps. So he did at least, when he wanted to invent something, he did invent it or develop it for his employer, which Fred didn't do. But there's another quote about Samuel. And when he was deemed to be exceeding his authority, he was firmly told not to transact any further business and not to leave the mine without permission but actually, Samuel quit that employment very soon after that. Nothing to do with genes, but probably influencing both men's ability to deal with the demands of their working life, particularly the humdrum aspects, were the difficulties in their personal life. Samuel had lost a, a young son to typhus. Fred lost his first child at weeks old. Not quite sure what, but a cot death of some sort. Um, Fred lost... First, a first wife and then a second wife, both at a fairly young age. Um, Fred's marital history um, is actually the complete antithesis to that. I'm going to quote verbatim from my mother's biography. From their first meeting, Fred and Lucy Mortimer were strongly attracted to each other. She was a vivacious, attractive young woman with a mass of auburn hair. However, Fred never proposed and never proposed. 
The reason, he had already in 1888 very unwillingly contracted a marriage in Buenos Aires. The myth varies, but the accepted one is that it had been a shotgun wedding, Fred had had a girlfriend, she'd had a married man on the scene as well, and there was a baby on the way. We'll never know the whole truth, but Fred could not break that marriage. I mean, she was presumably Catholic. In the end, he took the risk, he proposed to Lucy, she broke off an engagement to another man, no one gave just cause or impediment, and 20 years after that first wedding, he married her here in England. Interestingly, my mother relates, and this was she couldn't really understand it because she didn't know about this till after he died. When he talked about marriage, he would actually his marriage to Lucy. He would always talk about committing matrimony, not marrying. And he did play with words. So was this conscious or was it Freudian? I don't know. The first time Fred's British children were to learn of this actual marriage and of their own illegitimacy was after their father's death when his his legitimate South American daughter made a valid claim on his estate. The fact that that claim was made relatively soon indicates that that family in Buenos Aires had always been in contact with him. He was probably sending money to them. He was possibly being blackmailed. So his personal life really wasn't very straightforward, (coughs) and the stresses must have had an effect. This rather belies all that, because this apparently, I can't believe it, this is Lucy and her Bible class. (laughs) (laughs) Good grief. (laughs) What a woman. (laughs) Now, whether I assume they would be mill employees, I don't know. And whether it was this mill, or whether it was his own mill, I don't know. Anyway, whatever his personal problems, it... And whatever Samuels, it didn't pr- frustrate their ability to invent and innovate. Um, but Fred really did two time <coughs> the Smedley Company. In August 1910, 1910, he was granted a patent on his own behalf. By 1911, this same, I think it's a carding machine, had been patented in, which is that? That's Friend. No, no, that's the actual patent. That's the British one. And it was patented in France, and it was patented in Germany. Well, that's, so that's France and Germany. And that's the blueprint of the, car, the machine he invented. That's a carding machine, is it? Yes, 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 yeah. That's what, I've got the patent with me, the actual paperwork. Um, So William Else, this person who just could have been a connection family-wise, ran this small mill in Matlock, suggested that, and and Fred was already in with him. Oh, that's the registration of his company with William Else. And this is the Victoria Hall in Matlock, which um, had recently and dramatically, although without loss of life, the main floor of it collapsed into its swimming pool. And... (laughs) Mr. Els suggested that Fred buy it and that it become the company mill. So he did that, and that is where he set up Derwent Mills. And it was even in Smedley Street. I I can't believe it. (laughs) Right under the nose of his employers. I'm, I'm also rather afraid he may have pinched some of the skilled workforce while it was at it. They did, to some extent, get his comeuppance because war was declared very soon after this and his machines had to turn out socks and balaclavas for the troops and he didn't make much profit. And actually, at long last, his family was arriving. My mother was born in 1914. His, uh, after the war, his fortunes changed. He um, invented a way of spinning angora wool, which is quite difficult because the hairs, even on ungel- angora rabbits, are short shorter than sheep's wool or anything else. Um, and he, he called it Farida, and it obviously made him successful and probably prestigious. It was knitted. It was also beautifully dyed and embroidered onto silk evening stoles, shawls. There are two up there, bags. And again, learning from here, he very definitely targeted a high-end market. And Alicia's father, Charles, was his agent in London. Grandfather. Grandfather, sorry. His agent in London at a time. And he had an agency in New York. 
And then again, another connection with Japan. The emperor of Japan bought a full set of his underwear. I can't believe it was Angora under- underwear. <laughs> terribly itchy. But, <laughs> but of course he bought 365 of everything. Because you have to have one for each day of the year. So he was the best customer. That's really Can I just Yes. Because we have a, an apocryphal story here mm. in the mill, which we the only proof we have is a kind of, um, it's, it's a piece in the paper in about 1965, mm. where some retiring employee said that John Smedley Limited made the uh, underpants for the Mikado. Right. And then he had 365 oh. pairs. So that's. Well, uh, you that's see. So yeah, but I haven't got documentary evidence of that. Well, I mean, that's just. Like yes, it's the same. But it, there was a link, wasn't then? Definitely. Yeah. 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 It's not really the sort of thing you'd make up, is it? You know. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, and Fred actually also made um, outer garments as gifts for the princesses Margaret and Elizabeth, and got permission to donate. You know, give them. Um, and on the back of this, because one problem was moths, and the only thing in those days was camphor balls, he actually invented something he called dye moth, but he didn't patent that, and it's now mothac, uh, which I don't think we use any longer, but you know, that, that was one of his things. And quite a lot of the family worked for him at this time. Um, oh, that, sorry, I'll we'll, we'll miss that. That's actually. Um, a letter that just shows the, the head, the mill heading, you know, the headed paper. And that's uh, there's a letter from Alicia's father written. He used to come and stay with the family here and, and adorable. And adore, oh, yes, he, Fred was yeah. adored, oh, he was, he? yes, I do come to that. He was yeah, adored by everybody. I know, I rather, you know, <laughs> yeah, everybody loved him. And in fact, a lot of his workers called their first daughter Brenda after his first daughter, yeah. Um, and other people who worked for him here, so Alicia's grandfather, uh, he also employed Agnes, his sister, his nephew Bert, Bertie, Seward Reeves, another niece of Uncle Bertie, I don't quite know who that is. And I, again, I can't believe this, but I have found it. The rabbit hair, his wife's youngest sister, Wynne, was dispatched to Normandy to farm the rabbits. <laughs> and breed them and I can't make out if that was a short straw or a cushy number <laughs> but he was obviously a man to watch I mean anything, apart from anything else you know it was a big boost for Matlock presumably having this mill going and everything and he was approached by Viella who wanted to um, be able to spin a wool that wouldn't shrink so he invented a way of combining it with cotton and this is all our Clydella school shirts. Yeah. And he didn't get a proper contract for that. They sent him £10, and he sent it back. He was furious. <laughs> anyway, he had ten successful years here in Derwent Mills, and he sold it to Patton and Baldwins, and he had a two-year contract to work out, to work for them, and he was never allowed to use that, to do any of those processes again, which was fine. He was happy. He'd, he'd made quite a lot of money. And he retired to the Lake District and he bought this beautiful house, it's still there, it's called Summerhill. And um, he filled it with Chippendale and um, Chinese jade, uh, Georgian silver, Impressionist paintings. He laid out acres of garden, he bought trees from Kew. He installed a hydroelectric pump to power the house. And in the scullery he was trying to develop a synthetic chamois leather. Um, but he couldn't that, was, that all got done and he was just either he was restless or he'd run out of money I don't know but he started on his last fatal exercise which was to build a mill in the nearby market town of Ulverston this is, that's an archetypal textile mill isn't it I mean Victoria Hall was anything but an archetypal textile mill was this what he'd always dreamt of you know was this what he wanted to, to work in I don't know he experimented with spinning feathers but I don't think that lasted very long <laughs> and then he concentrated on his new process which combines silk and cashmere 
ultra fine gauge for underwear, three or four ply, ply for sweaters and things. Again, very high end. Again, he produced a set for the royal family. But this was the 1930s. The luxury market had gone. Um, we don't know. Um, the accepted wisdom in the town now, which is really nice, is that Fred built this mill because he couldn't bear to see all the unemployed people hanging around on street corners. And certainly he did provide employment, but he didn't have a school to work. They weren't textile workers in Alveston. That was all iron and steel and things in those days. So I don't know. But he, he, we think he had probably overspent at Summerhill. Oh, can you turn that round? Can I turn that round or not? Uh, we'll put our heads on that. Right. <laughs> that's, that's the sort of Chinese jade that he had catalogues for. I'm not saying that's a bit he bought, but he bought that sort of thing. He had spent an awful lot of money on this house. But he thought he could do anything, and he thought he could make a set success of this Ulvet. Um, uh, but it did, wasn't to happen. Lucy, his wife, died of cancer in early 1936. He missed her dreadfully. In May of that year, Fred himself, heavily in debt, this is awful, he died of a stroke at the dinner table in front of his two teenage daughters. My mother had been married and left home. For all that she was maybe over-forgiving, my mother did make him live again for the family, and she did make us realise how much she and her siblings adored and respected him, as did his nephews. And... Once he'd found an undoubted, a channel for these talents and skills, he does seem to have been liked and respected. He won numerous regattas in his yachts, which he also designed. His bees produced more honey than anyone else's. He was an ace on the golf course. He could cook. He introduced his daughters to wonderful literature. He bought them quantities of books. He wouldn't let them knit, because machines did that, but he did encourage them to do tapestry, and he invented a better way of having all your colours on different needles at the back, so you only had to pick up one needle and put it through. And he took them on a wonderful trip, the family, on a banana boat to the West Indies and Costa Rica. Um, and, but the standards of the time, he was a remarkably hands-on father, I think. I've just ended by saying I wish I'd known him. He'd have been a super-grandparent. <laughs> <laughs>